what I wanted to do was talk about improving ca patient care in hospitals, but take the skeptical view of uh, a lot of my colleagues at Prince Alfred who used to think that uh, improving patient care via standards was just bureaucratic and wasn't it but wasn't in it for them. Um, so hopefully you'll bear with me while we go through this. So um, the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare was uh, commenced in 2006. It's a rare beast in Australia in that it's COAG funded. That means all the states and the territories and the Commonwealth all pay a population based fee for the Commission to uh, work. It's supposed to lead and coordinate national improvements in safety and quality of healthcare based on best available evidence. Uh, we attempt to work in partnership with the Commonwealth, the states and territories, the private sector, with patients, clinicians, managers, and various uh, healthcare organisations to improve care and to improve safe and high quality care. Now, uh, we've got an extensive work program, and this is only a tiny bit of it. The most important things, the things that I wanted to share with you today are the National Health Service Standards and Accreditation and how that's being hooked up with, with initiatives like VASM and with APRA and the Australian Medical Council's uh, AMC's registration of practitioners to start to triangulate improvement in, 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 of patient care and to triangulate uh, clinicians, doctors, uh, particularly looking at their patient data and doing stuff to improve their patient data. So we'll mainly be talking about health service standards. However, other work that the commission does, we do a lot of stuff in variation, sentinel events, hospital hacks, hospital acquired complications. We're doing stuff around potentially preventable hospitalizations, healthcare associated infections, open disclosure or duty of candor about to occur in Victoria, consent and so on. So how does the hospital system assure its safety? So one of the pillars of this, we believe, is the health service standards, but on their own, they don't do anything unless there's engagement between the executive, the board and the clinicians. There's accreditation. Obviously, we have incident monitoring systems to look for trends within our, uh, within our system and, and trends in incidents. There's complaint processes. There's sentinel events and hacks. And then sector reviews, such as the neonatal uh, death reviews and obstetric reviews across the whole of the, of the population of people who are, uh, uh, receive obstetric care and so on. And at the moment, one of the things that I'll allude to is this hooking together of hospital accreditation, uh, surgical and physician assessment of your own out patient outcomes uh, that will allow you to be credentialed to the hospital, but also uh, take part in your registration through APRA. Now, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the National Health Service Standards. Now, most doctors have never actually looked at the health service standards. There are eight of them. There are two overarching ones. Uh, one is, uh, oops, one is clinical uh, governance. And clinical governance uh, is really the relationship between the hospital board hospital executive and all the clinicians in the hospital to ensure that uh, aspects of clinical care are appropriately considered at the board level, that if there are issues with care of patients that that's escalated to a high level within the hospital, uh, just like financial uh, reports and accounting would happen in a hospital. So that's really uh, uh, governance or supervision of the hospital. The second, whoops, the second major standard is called partnering with consumers. What we attempt to do there is to get the uh, institution to look at the population it serves. So be that uh, a metropolitan population or a rural and remote, remote population. Look at what the particular needs of that population are to make sure that the institution is serving those needs and to partner with those consumers or those patients uh, so that the services can be appropriately embedded within the community. And then there are a series of six other standards that are really, uh, sorry, uh, that are really uh, looking at aspects of care where, where things go wrong. So um, hospital acquired infections, medication safety, uh, this standard called comprehensive care, 
which wraps up things like falls and DVTs and delirium and self-harm and suicide and is attempting to push the system to assess uh, a patient on, a, on admission to a hospital to look at what, the, what that particular patient may suffer during the hospital stay and to mitigate those risks. Then there are things like communicating for safety, uh, the blood standard and recognising and responding to deterioration. So overall, uh, the standards as an overarching clinical governance or supervision of the process standard. There's a partnering with consumers standard and then attempts to mitigate the well-known risks that patients have when they're admitted to hospital. Um, so as I said, clinical governance really relies on a collaboration between the clinicians and the managers and the board. The board needs visibility that, cl that clinical care is safe appropriate and effective, just as they need visibility that the financial uh, affairs of the hospital are, are being going appropriately. And um, the standards need data to determine wh which and what should be a priority, to determine if improvements strategies are actually working and being effective. Now, within the standards, there are all these things called actions. And again, most of you won't have ever seen the standards and therefore won't have seen these actions. But what I want to highlight is a few of the actions that deal with issues for the interface between clinicians and governance and look at what the obligations are on the, on the hospital and what the obligations are on the clinician. And I think hopefully that will uh, give you some idea of where I'm going to take this talk. So um, one of the actions is action 1.23, credentialing and scope of practice. And this says health service organisations have processes to define the scope of pr clinical practice for clinicians, considering the clinical service capacity of organisation, the clinical service plans and needs of patients, uh, monitor clinicians' practices to ensure they are operating in their designated scope of clinical practice, review the scope of clinical practice of clinicians periodically <coughs> and whenever a new service is initiated or a procedure or a technology is, in is introduced or substantially altered. Now that is to get the hospital to buy in to understanding what service it's providing for its community and to try and get the hospital to look at, say, ensuring that uh, regional and rural hospitals aren't doing pancreatectomies uh, when in fact there aren't facilities to allow that to happen. Uh, that's nice. Action, uh, 1.24 is credentialing and also credentialing a scope of practice. Health service organisations conduct processes to ensure that clinicians are credentialed where relevant, monitors improve the effectiveness of credentialing processes. Now, what's this got to do with you as surgeons? So for you, the hospital has to look at understanding, making sure that you're registered and that you have your liability insurance and that you have appropriate specialist qualifications. They have, to, um, they have to agree with you what, what your scope of practice is to be through the credentialing process. They should be monitoring your attendance and participation in M&M &M and peer review. And they would want you to contribute to the M&M to the &M and peer review data, both contribution of, of thought and of analysis of, of uh, clinical care. So local audit, registries, the outputs of the Victorian Audit of Surgical Mortality, patient experience and outcome measures. So that in the m and you not only look at mortality and morbidity, but look at data around how your patients are, are going uh, and so that you can ensure the institution and the ultimately the community that you're serving, that uh, you're performing appropriately. Um, the hospital would want evidence of appropriate maintenance of skills, and that might be via volume of procedures and outcomes of those procedures, via whether you've had mentorship and supervision and whether you teach. So effectively credentialing and scope of practice should be a two-way process where uh, the M&M &M and peer review process looks at what's happening in your institution, looks at the outcomes of patients under your care and your colleagues' care, and jointly you engage with the, the um, institution in deciding whether uh, expanded services should occur or contracted services and whether the scope of practice is appropriate. 
The next thing in the standards is Action 1.27, which is evidence-based care. It says the health service organisation has processes that provide clinicians with ready access to best practice guidelines, integrated care pathways, clinical pathways and decision support tools relevant to their clinical practice and <coughs> support clinicians to use the best practice available, including where relevant clinical care standards developed by the commission. So this is an obligation on the institution to make sure that you have the tools to keep up to date, to make sure you have the tools to actually undertake uh, best practice and uh, uh, that the institution supports you. So here's an example of, of what that might look like for a surgeon. This is uh, perioperative uh, surgical uh, prophylax antibiotics prophylaxis in various craft groups. Probably you can't read the craft groups. The red is where the prophylactic antibiotic was either uh, was inappropriate. The green is where it's appropriate. Appropriate was defined as um, meeting the uh, either the, uh, the antibiotic therapeutic guidelines advice or local policy. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of red on that slide. Most of that red is caused by the timing of the first dose of antibiotics being inappropriate, often given way after induction of anesthesia and, and often after surgical incision, uh, which is, uh, as you'd all realise, too late. So um, we would expect the, your clinical governance to look at antibiotic use and antibiotic timing in your surgical, surgical units and to therefore bring that to your m and meetings to discuss the appropriateness or otherwise of your practice and whether you can, whether that they, they are evidence-based and whether you've got a policy to try and drag that performance up into the green zone. Then action 1.28 is around variation of clinical practice and health outcomes. And this says the health service organisation should monitor, monitor variation in practice against expected health outcomes, provide feedback again to clinicians on variation in practice and outcomes, review performance against external measures, support clinicians to take part in clinical review of their practice, use information on unwanted clinical variation to inform improvements in safety and quality systems, record the risks identified from unwarranted uh, variation in the risk management system. So what's unwarranted variation? This is a slide that when we showed it to you and Wallace some years ago, uh, this is hysterectomy rates across Australia. And uh, they're uh, mapped on to the uh, location of the, or the uh, resident, postcode of the residence of the patient. And the darker the color, the higher the hysterectomy rates. And you'll notice that there's this <coughs> extraordinary six times variation in hysterectomy rates between regional and rural areas and metropolitan areas. So uh, women are six times more likely to, under, to have suffered a hysterectomy if they don't live in the metropolitan areas of Australia. Uh, that would to me seem unbelievable and a, a reason to have a look at why there's so much um, hysterectomy in regional and rural areas. And in fact, Safer Care Victoria did significant work on the Victorian aspects of this slide uh, where down here there are significant geographical areas where there is over-representation of hysterectomy. And that was partly because of lack of access to marina IUDs and partly uh, because of lack of access to endometrial ablation. And so those issues have uh, been attempted to be fixed. <coughs> so examining variation is a really important aspect of uh, what a surgeon should do. Now, um, APRA, as you will know, because the college has recently changed its CPD requirements, has started to look at, has developed a new professional performance uh, framework. That pro professional performance framework envisages stronger CPD. So as well as uh, educational activities to build knowledge and skills, practitioners will be required to review their performance and measure their outcome uh, against uh, either peers or international um, standards. Now, you could prove that you're doing that via m and meetings in your hospital where you're sharing your VASM results, where you're sharing your audit results around uh, the care that you're uh, providing your patients and where uh, outlier patients or outlier issues are addressed. 
So it's expected that health service organisations uh, will review variation and appropriateness and, and assist clinicians in achieving uh, this uh, professional framework, performance framework, by providing data and assisting with the analysis of that data at the m and and peer review meetings. Now, most, most of us haven't ever had to do a review clinical variation, and there are some tools available from the Commission that might help you with this. Uh, this is a user guide for the review of clinical variation in healthcare um, that the Commission published uh, in the middle of last year. And I want to run through one of the case examples that are in here just to step you through what you might think about doing when you see clinical variation within your own services. So the first thing is, this, was, this is an example taken from uh, hip surgery, fractured hip surgery at a major metropolitan hospital where they discovered they were having problems with uh, morbidity and mortality of elderly patients who'd fractured their hip. <coughs> um, the head of the orthopedic department uh, wanted to investigate variation because of, uh, they perceived that there was a high mortality rate and that many patients weren't being uh, taken to theatre within 48 hours. It's within the standards and the guidelines. Um, so they selected a clinical area to assess. They identified what, uh, through the hip fracture registry uh, that they were an outlier compared with other hospitals and their performance was below the national and state averages. So they knew they had a problem. Um, so the, uh, orthoped the head of orthopaedics got one of the orthopaedic registrars to start to look at the hospital registry results to make sure that the data was valid so that they, were, that they weren't acting on invalid data. Then they started to review the three months data within their own hospital, looking at how long it was taking to get patients to surgery and discovered that 50% of their patients, that only 50% of their patients undertook, underwent surgery within 48 hours compared to the national average of 77% um, and the target of 100%. Um, they felt that this needed to be addressed uh, uh, rapidly. And there are all sorts of drivers for this uh, low rate of uh, early intervention. One of them being NOAX and a reluctance or, or anticoagulants, so a reluctance of the orthopedic surgeons to operate on patients who are on anticoagulants. Uh, the surgical team met with the hospital to look at delays in access to surgery. Um, a proportion of the delays was because of what was thought to be medically unfit patients. Some of it was because of surgical inability, uh, in unavailability. Some of it was because of um, the length of stay in the emergency department. And some of it was because theatres weren't available, particularly out of hours. So they explored potential reasons for the variation. <coughs> And then with the hospital administration, they acted to improve the care and embed changes within the health service. And th things they did were extend theatre hours, open up theatres out of hours, uh, uh, and often, had, in fact, uh, had a routine um, orthopaedic surgical list on the weekends, uh, rather than having to sit the orthopaedic surgical list on the emergency list to try and uh, improve access to theatres. And then follow-up monitoring showed a reduction in delays of surgery and therefore uh, uh, a movement back towards the national average. Oops. But again, so um, what does this have to do with the audit of surgical mortality in VASM? Um, so uh, peer review and M&M &M meetings are really important. It's important that uh, senior clinicians attend them and uh, we're pushing for that to be part of credentialing that if you don't go to the M&M &M meetings and the, and the uh, clinical review meetings that maybe you're not making an appropriate contribution to your department and to your hospital and therefore questions the reason that you're at, that you're, uh, at the institution. Uh, we think uh, audit of surgical mortality is one aspect, uh, but would be a benefit from expansion into uh, morbidity as well, uh, and looking at variation. One of the most important things to come out of the audits of surgical mortality are trends. And uh, a lot of the work around hip fracture came out of the audit of surgical mortality that showed 
vastly different mortalities in patients with fractured um, neck of femur uh, in different institutions. And that was highlighted by the, surg uh, the uh, surgical mortality audits in several states uh, in, the, in your um, rounded up reports. So we think these reports need, uh, when an individual surgeon is counseled by the uh, audit that that needs to be just, that surgeon needs to discuss what the issues were in their peer review, in their M&M, &M, uh, so that their peers can have a view and look to see that they're not having the same issue and can help uh, improve care. So that's a brief overview of the standards how we think the standards should be integrated into your practice and how we hope that uh, audits and data and uh, looking at, at your own practice and your colleagues' practice can improve care. And I look forward to your questions afterwards.